Well, thank you for those of you online, welcome. And for those who are here today and those who watch um, throughout the week, we bless you. I'm trying to have some continuation as we move forward with what's happening on Tuesday night and what began to happen even 100 days before the beginning of the year. Um, like everybody, we were caught by surprise by the, uh, the Chinese virus, and I am calling that not because a politician called it that. I called it that in January. And it was because of Pastor Jeff, who's here, opened my eyes and showed me where it was coming from, how it was made in the P4 lab. We announced it and took a lot of criticism. And lo and behold, lo and behold, everything that we disclosed and said and the Lord released has come to the light. A little bit more to come yet, but that's because of politics. It hasn't. The bottom line is it was a curse released from the pit of hell, but it was manufactured by a, a, a group of people that hate this country and everything we stand for and also sent out about the world to do exactly what it has done. Do not be deceived. And the Lord prepared us. He told us there was a shift coming. He told us to be prepared for it. He told us that the whole world was being put on pause. We were entering into a place of next. And in that place of next, some would be in a place prepared of God that we could make decisions from, and others would be in a place of next we don't want to be in. And the whole world is there. The whole world is there. Last night, my wife was flipping through the channels late, and she found something on PBS, and it was Neil Diamond doing a concert. And I don't know when it was, but there had to be probably 20,000 people there. And she looked at me and she said, those days are gone. Those days are gone. And I realized the enormity of what has happened. And we may or may not see those days again like it is. And man keeps striving, trying to come off a pause and to do things that are different. And God keeps pleading with mankind to get attention. And he has gotten some, but he hasn't gotten others. In the past, when we have had urgencies and problems and crises in this country and in the world, people have rushed into church. That's where they go. They may not stay there long, but they go to church. I remember I was coaching football down in Miami, and I always had whatever team I coached, we always took a knee. And in that, we had a, a favorite statement. And that statement, my, every one of, of, of my young men learned, and they were able to say it. And it was, let there be no doubt. And in that instance, when we would cry out, let there be no doubt, it would also say, I can't do everything but what I can do, and by the grace of God, I shall do it. And we would rush out onto the playing field and go with that umfa in our spirit, that faith that we weren't there to lose, we were there to win. I never... Never, never taught my, my, my young men to be good losers. I taught them to be fair losers, not good losers. Good, losing isn't good. I don't know whoever put that, you know, in our hearts. And, you know, it's not good. We want to win. We're victory. We're, we're champions. We're conquerors. And we don't want to accept defeat. We'll, we'll do what we need to do with it, and we'll be gracious in defeat, but we're not going to accept it. That's not our metric. And all of a sudden... We had the towers coming down in New York on 9-11, and that night we had practice, and there was five different teams on this huge practice field in Miami, and I saw everybody was shaking and quivering, and families were shook up, and they were still looking in the skies if something else was going to fall out, and my team, we went right to practice, and all of a sudden, the fellow that was in charge of that whole field and that whole league, he came up, and I thought that he was going to chastise me because I had a few parents on my team that complained to him that I took a knee with my, my young men, and I said, well, this is real simple to resolve. They either get me with the knee or I'm out of here. But you see, victory gives you a voice, and we were undefeated. So they liked the fact they had a good coach who could win. They just didn't like the fact that two of them didn't like the fact that this coach did it and gave glory to God. But you see, we can't compromise that. And all of a sudden, they singled me out, not to throw me off the field, but to bring me into the middle and lead the people in an exhortation to lift up their, their hearts, to take them out of sinking and to lead the whole place in prayer. Between family and children, maybe 800 to 1,000 people. The next week, it was all gone. And I noticed in church that Sunday, the place was filled and people were coming. And the next week, there were some more. But then all of a sudden, it began to die off. But now, 
Now the deceit and conspiracies of the enemy have even tried to take that away where people can't go to church. So they're supposed to be on television or watching something, and and something happens when people get comfortable and familiar. They begin to create a new ritual, a new tradition, and that ritual and tradition is, well, you know, Sunday, uh, we're not supposed to go anyway because some little short guy who says he's a scientist named Fauci said, we should do this, we should do that, we should do this, and the truth of the matter is, I like the guy, he seems like a very nice guy, reminds me of a short uncle of mine, but he hasn't gotten anything right. We know he hasn't gotten anything right, but people still listen to him. And I'm not telling you that you should defy science, but I'm also going to tell you don't put your faith in science. And we declared early on that we have the spirit of life, the life in the spirit, life in the spirit of Christ. As it says in Romans, it's a law, a law of the life in the spirit of Christ. And we discussed how John G. Gates had had been a missionary working with the bubonic plague in Africa in the turn of the century in 1900, and he never got sick. He never got sick, and they couldn't understand why, and the doctors and the scientists were trying to figure it out, and he told them, because I live by the law of the life of Christ. And so we're not defying anything, but we're also not going to conform to it Because, beloved, as I've told you, and as now we're beginning to see, that isn't the end of woes. That isn't even the beginning of woes. The birth pains began a long time ago, but we're in the midst of the throw of that dark and gloomy day that the Lord had talked about. Now, I want to lift your spirits up because I've done a pretty good job in the last few weeks of depressing them a little bit, telling you about all the bad stuff, trying to lift it up. So that's why today I had written to you And I had said to you that there's a way out um, to let there be no doubt. This is a conspiracy against the saints of God and and against the earth. It's a diabolical plot. It's a fight of life and death. And it's light versus darkness and good versus evil and Christ versus antichrist. Let there be no doubt that is the battle that you're in. Now, you can choose to say, I don't want to be in the battle. You're still going to be affected by it whether you want to be it or not. And so I've been preaching for a long time that there's levels of how we deal with what we're supposed to do. And I want to share with you a theme, a theme that comes off uh, from a teaching that first and foremost came out of Daniel and then was written of seven different ways in seven different times. In Daniel 7, 25, chapter 7, verse 25, this is what's written. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. And he shall, and this is the focus, he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Now, uh, if you come from a different persuasion, you may not have a comprehension of what this means, this interpretation of saints that first came in Hebrew, and then the Aramaic, and then the Greek. It's talking about believers. Those are people alive today, not those who have passed on and received sainthood. Those are the living Uh, creatures that love God today. He shall try to wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and a time and a half. And then there's more. We understand in, in Daniel 12, 7, and another one says, for the times and times and a half, and he shall scatter the power of the holy people until all of these things are finished. Revelation eleven twelve. the holy city shall be tread underfoot, and now it gives us a timeline, 42 months. Another one, uh, uh, Revelation eleven three says 1,203 score days, which is 42 months. Another one in Revelation twelve sixteen says the same things. Another one in twelve thirteen says a time in times and a half. And then we see in 13, 5, that this will be, this power is given unto this evil force for 42 months to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So now we're beginning to define what it is. How many of you know that if you can't see your enemy and you can't understand what your enemy is doing, that it's very hard to defeat your enemy? How many of you know that? Well, we know this is an invisible enemy that's manifesting with physical occurrences here on earth. But we have an invisible God who's manifesting with more power. And he's made a promise and a covenant to you if you believe in Jesus Christ that you will overcome what he is trying to overcome. 
His, his whole banner cry is to overcome and wear down the saints. And we see that it was granted unto him in Revelation 12 to have authority over the tribes, tongues, and nations, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him with this caveat, except those whose names have, are written in the book of Lamb. Now, so you understand, everybody's name appears in the book of Lamb until it gets erased. And what erases it is our belief or our unbelief, our disobedience or obedience to God. And there's only one way unto the Father, and that's through the Son. You can't earn righteousness, but it can be imparted to you. Because Jesus Christ, the Word tells us very clearly, was made sin, who knew no sin. He had never sinned that you might be made the righteousness of God. The moment that Jesus Christ imparts righteousness to you and I, because we believe, then we are made the righteousness of God and your book is written in indelible ink in the Lamb's book of life. So now we begin to understand there are two groups of saints, two classes, two categories, those who overcome and those who are overcome. And so now we want to say, I want to be an overcomer. How many people here say, I want to be an overcomer? I want, to, I want to run my race. I want to finish my race. I want to overcome. Uh, I don't want to be in that class who hasn't overcome. And isn't it alarming? It's saddening. It's frightening that people that just say they believe in Jesus Christ but continue to be disobedient to God, to sin, to live lives that are immoral, to live lives that they willfully make a choice against, uh, in lawlessness against God that some way, somehow, Unless the grace of God prevails in their life, they will not have their book, their name in the book of life. They will not have, have eternal life. These are people. Sometimes they go to church. Sometimes they don't. And they, if you ask them what their faith is, they'll tell you Christian, many of them. But they're not walking as Christians. And then we understand through the book of, book of Revelation in chapter 3, the church of Laodicea. And in fact, all of those churches, the seven churches that are, are given to us, that there's a definition of those who will not make it till the final moment. And Christ is pleading with us, with everybody, to get our lives right and to walk holy with him. You know, if you ask most believers, people that say they're Christians, are you holy? You'd be surprised the answer you don't get or the answer you do get. You see, they're not certain what it means to be holy. Um, they're humble enough not to say they're holy, but not out of a humility to God, but out of an ignorance of who they are. Beloved, if you believe in Jesus Christ and you're obeying God, you are holy. You're a holy vessel unto the Lord. And because of that, you have access to everything that the Father has for you in the now. And that's what you need to overcome. We have to be overcomers. Otherwise, there are Christians who are not totally built up, grounded, or committed to their faith. And then there are those who are equipped and committed to persevere. So it's not just about salvation, beloved. It's not just about a prayer of salvation. And thank God for the spirit of evangelism. And thank God for Jesus Christ who draws. The Father says he draws all men unto Jesus who draws them all unto the Father. We thank the Lord for that. But somewhere between the confession of Jesus Christ as Lord and a commitment of a, of a spirit-filled Christian life, people can get detoured and fall off the bus. And we need to have a heart for that. I have a heart for souls, but right now, my heart is burning with reformation for saints, for believers, for Christians, for the body of Christ. This is preparing the way for the coming of the Lord. It's not good enough to just tell people about Jesus. And it's fine that they make a confession unto Jesus, but what are we saving them into? Unbelief? We're saving them into conformity? We're saving them into churches that have shepherds that believe that homosexuality is okay from the pulpit, or that we can be those who embrace things that aren't of God. Listen, we love everybody and everything, and God has his heart in love in everyone, and that's between them and the Lord. But what we do in the kingdom of God, we are responsible for. And I believe, let me tell you something, you're looking at, at one used to be great sinner, I don't practice sin, so I'm no longer a sinner, so I'm not judging anybody. 
but I know what to do when I fall short. I run to the arms of Jesus and I confess. And that opportunity is for everybody up until their last breath. Because he so loved the world, the Father, that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whomsoever shall call upon his name shall be saved. That means the nastiest, most vile, vicious, immoral, unethical person in the world has an opportunity for the saving grace through the blood of Jesus Christ. Everybody up to that last breath. So we do well not to judge, because that might be your neighbor in eternity for the rest of your life. And don't we pray that it is? The first shall be last and the last shall be first. That's the heart of the Father. That's the heart of God. So we understand there's an overcoming. And we understand that our calling is not to indulge just for ourselves. But we have to have a heart and a commitment to engage every saint to be prepared. Now, last week, I spoke on there's a whole lot of shaking going down. It used to be going on, but he died. And so now it's going down. And so there's a whole lot of shaking going down. And I, I want to quote to you something in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6. Because if there's any element that all of us, whether we believe in God and have faith or don't believe in God and have faith, everything that everybody's dealing with right now that's trying to crouch into our lives, that is published hour after hour, minute after minute, under every media stream there is except some Christian networks that's out there all the time unless you want to watch some oldies. In fact, my wife will tell you, the only channel I really care about now is the oldie movies. I think she thinks I've gone over the edge, and I'm just looking them and loving them because they're just so simple to understand, and, they just, and, and they're so well done with so little. But unless, unless you turn all of that off, then what you're having to overcome is fear. And it says, be strong and, of good and be courageous or of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not fear nor be afraid of them who, the enemies of your soul and of your spirit. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Now, if you want to overcome... You need to understand that it's who you're walking with that helps you to overcome. You can't do it on your own, and you don't want to do it on your own. This should be something that we bind on our arms. If you go to Jerusalem, in fact, many times, and you see it all the time, Joshua, in New York City, you see the Hasidim in the Orthodox Jews, and at that given hour, they stop, they get their box out there, tefillim, and they bind their arm with that black little leather piece, and they bind the word to that their arm, and they begin to davit and to, to practice that word of God. Well, I'm not telling you to bind something and look a little crazy, but it's okay if you want to. And I don't care whether you davit or not, but let this word speak into your spirit and your heart. Be strong. Be courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified of anything that is coming your way. And beloved, this is just a tune-up. You say, you mean, Pastor, there's more coming. I don't know if it's viruses. I don't know if it's earthquakes. I don't know if it's hell from heaven. I don't know what it is, but I know there's more coming. And I know that, that God cannot be outsmarted. And I know that this is the hour that he told us would come upon the earth. And we could either ignore it and you could say, oh, there's been doomsday pastors all through. But none of them have lived right now. None of them have lived right now. And we are in that time to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. So be strong and courageous. Put it in your heart. Don't be afraid or terrified. And we're going to talk about how to do that. Why? For the Lord, your God, he goes with you. I want you to, to receive that deep into your spirit, to feel it, to understand it, to see it. There's a Hebrew word called chazah. Chazah is one who doesn't just hear the word, and just read the word, but seize the word. What did Isaiah say? He said, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up. And we had other prophets and said, I see the word. We had many who cried out in that way. And so I want you to see the word. He is the living word. He's Jesus Christ. And the word of, of God has life. And see this word. See the Lord, however you want to imagine him. However you see him, see him going with you. See him not just there, distance away to a prayer that's a distance that you have to somehow bring him from heaven to earth. He promises he's there with you. And also he says he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Why is that important? Well, for that one person who didn't raise their arm that says they were perfect 
and holy and they're doing okay. Let me tell you what it means. It means no matter if you sin and fall away, he's not going to forsake you. He's still going to be with you. How about you begin to pray to the never forsaking father, the never forsaking father. Now, for those of us who are fathers and those who've had fathers, some of our fathers uh, were taken away. Some weren't there. Some uh, made choices to abandon. Some didn't know their fathers. Um, and, and some had a relationship with their fathers. It doesn't matter, but no matter what it is, in a human relationship of fatherhood, something always falls short, always falls short. And there's always regrets, whether it comes from the family or from the man himself. Fatherhood has flaws here on earth. And that's why we're in that era of the spirit of Elijah when Malachi cried out and he said, in this time, he will be turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. He's also bearing his heart to us. How important the father relationship is. Fathers, if you want to be the best father we can for our children, we need to embrace the Father in heaven and to show them the one that will never forsake them, that isn't going to die of a physical ailment, that isn't going to abandon them, that isn't going to be there exactly at the moment they need, or when they're somehow alone and they can't get back to you, when your words can't make the difference. This is the time that we sow the love and the heart of Father God into everybody's hearts, turning the hearts of the children to the fathers, and the fathers to the children. That is the clarion word for this moment. That is why we have the never forsaking God. He has promised us. Psalms 46, verse 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. You know why I like that? Because we already know he's all-powerful. That's omnipotent. We already know he's all-knowing. That's omniscient. And now we understand and learn he's ever-present. He's everywhere at all the time, and he's walking with you. He's not just beside you. He's walking with you. And how many of us love that old poem, that old picture that showed one set of footsteps in the sand and the Father carrying you through that place and through that time. The Father will never forsake you. He will never leave you. He's a never forsaking God. Hebrews 13, 5. Paul got it because I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Proverbs 18, 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. You see, that's why the place of next that the Lord has invited us into and opened the door for the righteous isn't the same place of next for others. And what did he have us do? Very early on as we came together on Tuesday's night, we established the banner of the Lord over the house, over the place of next, so that we could run into it. The righteous run into it, and they are safe. The unrighteousness can't enter because it's a holy place, and holiness cannot uh, mix with sin. That's why if we want to be those who know what to do in these times of trouble, we want to be able to run into that strong tower. We want to be able to have a place, a safe place of refuge. And we're going to be dealing with that. There are places of refuge, both geographically and spiritually, that need to be identified in our lives so we know where to be at the time to be it in. Beloved, I'm telling you, tough times are coming. They're going to get rougher. Just if you can't get it spiritually, then, then get it any way you get there. Get it economically. You can't have a country that is now $25, $26 trillion in debt going another two, three, four trillion dollars more in debt, and all it is is digital. Digital means that any little number out of place throws it haywire. It doesn't work. You can't have a country where the unemployment rate is as high as it is without some kind of suffering. And the solutions aren't the remedies. That's just a practical sense. You can keep throwing $600 a week at people, but I can tell you from personal experience, people are not going back to work because they're making more money not to go to work. And so when they're not going to work, then people don't have jobs and you can't open places. Is that the remedy? Is that the remedy? And, and, and this I know, this I know, my grandfather who came over as an immigrant and was a slave in the mines, five cents a day, he was a slave in the mines, so we understand that. <clears throat> he went to work during the Depression. 
In fact, if you go down South Avenue, a lot of those bricks were laid by him. And you know how he got his depression check? He went to work. But we don't want to have people lose their self-esteem. So it's okay if they stay home and get six, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a week without doing anything because after all, it would be an insult to have to go work for your money. Huh? Think about what we're teaching. Think about what the goal is. Think about it being imposed upon all society. And we could expand this all over the world. We could begin to talk about what's going on in the streets of Jerusalem, what's going on in the Soviet, well, what used to be the Soviet Union in Russia, what's going on in China, the oppressions all over the place. We could talk about all of it. And in every one of those, we could dissect it down to a point where if we're relying upon man to solve the problems, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And we know there's that voice that's going to come out and it's going to get stronger and say, peace, peace, peace. And everyone's going to run to it because it sounds like a solution. And that same voice is going to be blaspheming God, sometimes directly and sometimes indirectly. All you have to do is listen to the voices today and you'll hear blaspheme of God left and right from people who say they're Christians. And then those that stand up and stand for the word of God, they're intolerant. They're, they're too far off to one side or the other side. And so we have a clash of a left and a right extreme. And so the right way is to be what? Moderate. What does moderate do? Well, that's okay. And that's okay. I mean, after all, we all have to get along. That's what moderate does. And that's where the world's being pushed. That's where the world's being pushed. Moderate is subjective. What's moderate today wasn't moderate yesterday. And that moderate continues to get pushed over to the extreme. Blaspheme of God. So, what line of thinking does it take? How do we move? I will never forsake you. Now, here's what I want to share with you. We understand, unless you want to be ignorant, unless you have your hand in the, head in the sand and you just don't want to face facts. It's not hard to convince people times are rough right now. You know, two years ago it was hard. Matter of fact, coming into January, it was hard, only because if you weren't living in poverty, if you weren't uh, uh, somehow a slave to poverty, and there are people that have been trying to get out that are slaves to poverty, those are the ones we need to focus upon in, in, in our own hearts, in our Christian hearts. If you weren't there, then this message said at that moment, and think about how long ago that was, eight months ago. This message given eight months ago, even seven months ago, even six months ago, would not have stuck. Because we had those people, those voices, those prophetic voices that came out and said, this problem is going to supernaturally go away on Easter. It's going to supernaturally go away on Pentecost. It's going to be gone, but it's still here. And that's because God is the voice, and the people who speak in His name ought to be sure that they hear of God. Politics isn't going to solve it. False prophets isn't going to solve it. You can hear any itchy word that you want to hear, but if it's not from God, it's only soothing for a moment. It's not going to solve the problem. The ways of the enemy, the ways of the enemy of your soul can be very dramatic or they can be very subtle. Now, let's talk about the word overcome first of all. It says that the enemy of your heart, your spiritual enemy, is intent upon wearing down the saints. It's a matter of who shall overcome. That word overcome has several meanings, but one of them is, is who gains superiority. So if you look at it that way, the force of evil trying to gain superiority over the people of God, the people of God trying to gain superiority over the enemy, that's the strife, that's the conflict, that's the battle. And it's not one spiritual battle, and it's not overcome by simply pleading something over it and feeling that you resisted it and it's gone. No, you've been given the victory, but you have to exercise the victory every day. I could give you enough seeds to plant enough corn to carry you the rest of your life, but if you don't plant the seeds and nurture them, you're not going to eat. And so we have faith, but faith that's not working is dead. And faith that says Jesus Christ is itself isn't going to overcome for you. There's not a devil or a demon that doesn't believe Jesus Christ is. They believe that Jesus Christ is. They're not obedient to him. They fear him. So you take your faith. It might be a mustard seed of faith. In fact, if I were you and it were me, I think we should store up a whole arsenal of mustard seeds. Let's call them faith bullets. 
And we should have them ready and planted already to be growing. And when that little mustard seed grows as small as it is, it grows into something very large quickly, doesn't it? 15 feet tall. We had the prophecy of the Chinese bamboo here twice. And that Chinese bamboo, it starts off as just a little plant. And sometimes it doesn't grow for seven years, but then all of a sudden in the seventh year, it begins to grow four feet per week. And it shoots up. We want to plant those faith seeds in our lives right now. How do we do it? By first of all, knowing the Word of God, receiving the Word of God, hearing the Word of God. Faith cometh by and hearing the... And these are those who overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Christ in me is greater than he who is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My God goes before me. He never forsakes me. We declare the word of God. We speak it. And we do not allow a spoken word into our spirit, into our house, into our residence, into our business, into our car, into our relationships that is negative against the word of God. Because it has power. Those are active voices that speak to heaven and earth. And when you speak these negative things and it becomes part of your life, it gets a root in your life. That's one of the greatest avenues of deliverance is to get rid of negative speaking. Just don't do it. Sometimes you have to smack it right in the face when it's given to you. I don't have the time now, but in my own life and for other people, I have received bad words, words that I would never walk again, that I would be in a wheelchair, words that I was going to die, a gun pointed to my head, the thing going off, an airplane crash, but it was the word of the Lord screaming out of my mouth that preserved me. And I want to tell you something, that was a moment of life and death. The wrong word would have probably taken me out before my time. It was the word of God. One time I didn't even know the Lord and the word came out. God help me! Where did that come from? That came from Lord God Almighty. Somehow it was imparted into me. I want to tend to believe it was from somebody in my bloodline. I want to believe it might go back to Father Abraham. I don't know where it went to, but out of me came, God help me! And that is the inheritance of the saints to their children. If you want to give your children an inheritance, speak the faith of God whether they receive it or not. Declare it in their lives. Set it forth. Now the enemy can be very subtle. Very subtle. Genesis 3 verse 1, he came as a snake. And it says he was subtle. And another word for that is crafty. And what it is is it's deceiving with precision. It's not just speaking out and letting you understand completely what's going on. These are well-crafted plans. That's why I said it's a conspiracy. It's a plot against our lives. It's a plot against the kingdom of God. Subtlety. Well, you know something? It came alive to me just two days ago. Two days ago, I was doing what I've been doing all summer long, and I'd done just for three days in a row because for whatever reason, my wife didn't want to help me. She conveniently got lost when it came time to go water all the flowers and the plants, and I say that with a smile on my face because I enjoy doing it anyway. It's 45 minutes of solitude for me and the Lord, and I'm speaking to the flowers and becoming one with nature and enjoying the, the green thumb a little bit, having been a farmer. And I stepped where I always step. I stepped where I've stepped for a couple years. I stepped where I just stepped for the last three days. And it was some rocks that were in our landscape and right in the front of our porch. And I'm watering away. And the next thing, I feel a sting. Then I feel another sting. Then I feel another sting. And how many of you have ever been stung by a swarm of yellow jackets? And something stings you in the foot and you feel it up here. Something stings you here and you feel it right here. Something stings you somewhere and you're not sure where you're getting stung and pretty soon you're like this and, and you're doing the hoobie-jubie and running out of there as fast as you can. And I looked at it and I said, where did those come from and how did they, they weren't there yesterday, but they're there today. And I looked up and I looked down and I said, devil, you're a liar. And I began to pray in the spirit and I was like this and shaking them off and you know, they hurt. Those yellow jackets hurt. And, and, uh, and, and I ran in the house and got some, some uh, alcohol. I didn't know what. I just poured it on me, poured it all over me. And then I said, ah, stinking things. And I went out there with the hose and flooded them. And I flooded them some more. And I flooded them some more. And I flooded them some more. And I was cursing the devil while I was at it. And I said, you're subtle. 
You're subtle. You sucked me in to conformity. My guard was down. But what you intended for bad, I intend for good. You just awakened me. I'm going to be watching like a hawk at everything that happens. I'm going to pray for more discernment. I'm going to pray that the Lord keeps my eyes open and I understand the plots of the enemy and foil them before they come into my life. And I'm going to plant those seeds of faith and pray against those things. And I'm not going to sit here and harbor my fears. I'm going to dismantle those weapons because no weapon that is formed against you. Come on, no weapon that is formed against you. We want to speak it. We want to believe it. We want to say it. We want to be active with it. So yes, we're in a war. We're in a fight. It's an epic clash between good and evil. It's the Antichrist versus Christ. It's the fact that he will do everything he can to resist the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he will not succeed. However, it's an overcoming battle. It's an overcoming choice. We can either be overcome or we can overcome. And finally this, it says in Daniel and also in Revelation that he would work extra hard to wear you down. You invest yourself into something and it comes into your season and all of a sudden it's taken away from you. And you look up and you say, now what do I do? A calamity comes upon you. An illness comes upon you. A child in rebellion is severed off. Something suddenly comes upon you. And with all of that, you're looking for one good voice and you're lonely and you're weary and all you hear is doom and gloom. All you hear is how bad it is. All you hear is that you're totally out of control of your life. That's the weariness. And that's why we need to know we're walking with God. Because he promises to direct every step of the righteous person. So, class number one, accept Jesus and his righteousness. Practice righteousness. How do we practice righteousness? The word of God the conscience of the Holy Spirit. Choose to do the will of God. Choose not to sin. And we all fall short. So what do we do? We repent. Oh, the Lord loves repentance. I don't know about you, but thank God that he's a God that loves repentance. Because I'm at that altar every day. Every day I find a reason to be back at that altar. And sometimes it's just me and the Lord having a soak and tear and party where I look back and say, wow, I was so foul. Wow, I didn't deserve to to make it through that. Wow, I wasn't right with that person and I can't even see them or find them again. Wow, I was, Lord, but thank you, Jesus, for your repentance. Thank you, Lord, that you go in my past and in my presence and in my future and that you make things right that I can't make. Thank you, Lord, that you redeem our time Do you know what it means that God redeems your time? We can't go back in time and fix all the wrong things we did. Man, I wish there was some people I could hold in these hands, these same hands that bit the 11 daylights out of them, that darn near killed a few people with them. I wish I could put them back in my hands and cry on their shoulders. They're not even alive. They're gone. But God can. God redeems our time. God redeems those harsh words that were said against you and that you said. God redeems the abandonment, the rejection. God redeems it all. He's a loving father. He loves his son as much as he loves us, but he so loved the world so much that he gave us this son who gave his life. Not just his life, but his whole soul. He was made sin, and the soul that sins must die. Some people don't like that awakening. They don't like that. They call it a teaching. It's not a teaching. It's reality. Paul said, who is he that ascended? But first, he descended. And then he amplifies it again, descended into the lower parts. Christ descended into hell, stained with my sins. Not his, mine. What these hands did, he took the lashes for. What this mouse said. He took the lashes for, for the larceny, the gossip, the adultery, the sin, the fornication, the theft, 
the immorality, the lust, the blaspheme of God. He took it all, not just in a category, but for you and me personally. Your name was on his hands, those blood-stained hands, as he went back to the Father and he presented that blood at the altar. And he said, this is my blood that has been shed for you and for me. We have a way, beloved. The enemy of your soul, he's working hard to overcome you. The world isn't your friend. Your flesh could be your biggest enemy. Your friends could be setting traps for you. You could fall into a trap tomorrow, tonight, but God has a way out. There's one, only one, who you can rely upon all the time, and that's God the Father through Jesus, the Son of God. They didn't leave us alone. They sent us the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit not only gives us discernment, but goes and watches with seven eyes. (laughs) I'd like to see those seven eyes someday that look all to and fro around the earth. That's a total surveillance system for you watching. How many of you would like to be plugged in to a surveillance system that protects you from everything at all times? That's the Holy Spirit. That's why we're going to move strong in the Holy Spirit in this church for the next month. That's why we're not going to let something become old and familiar. We're going to press in. We're going to dig. We're going to call upon the activation of the Holy Spirit and all the gifts of God so that we can be equipped and empowered to stand in this day of darkness. Yes, Lord. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord, or for any reason whatsoever, you once confessed Him as your Lord, but you know as you stand here today, there's a conviction in your heart that it's just time. It's just time to recommit, to get back in line with God. No judgment. No judgment. Know this. The angels in heaven rejoice with the Father and the Son for every soul that they can write the name in the book of life. I believe that names that are saved in Christ are written in an ink that nothing can overcome or resist. I believe it's called the blood of Jesus. And when he puts your name in that book with that blood, He makes a covenant with you that he's there for you for everything and that everything that the Father has is yours in abundance. Could I ask every head to be bowed and every eye closed, please? And If you're watching online, take a moment. Search your soul. Search your heart. Let this be the best day of the rest of the days of your life. If you're feeling it in your heart that you just want to show the Lord. Nobody else. I've asked every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm looking and they are. Thank you for being obedient. And you just want to show the Lord and all the angels in heaven and say, yes, that's me. Let me pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. Thank you. If that's you, just, yes, I see your hand. Just put your hand up, please, and wave it to the Lord, wherever you're at. No shame, no judgment. Yes just a day. It's a time to come back. Yes, I see you. I see you. Yes. Yes. Father, you see. You see our hands, Lord. Just repeat this prayer. All of us together, please. Father, you are a gracious God. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. I believe in God the Father, Jesus Christ my Savior, and the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins. 
You didn't deserve it. You descended into hell. You paid the price for my sins. And then you resurrected. And you took your blood to the throne room and presented it as my sacrifice. Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I receive. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Father, forgive my sins. Holy Spirit, come into my life and help me to overcome. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.